our hearts. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Well, we are turning to behold amazing grace today to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2. We have been away from our study in Ephesians for some time, different reasons for that, us being out of town and coming back and uh, a themed message regarding the incarnation and these various things going on, our our text for the year message. So we are now finally returning to our study in Ephesians, and we're coming now to <clears throat> consider primarily verse five, but we'll be at the begin at the latter part of verse four as well as we're coming to this. May the Lord give us help as we read His Word together. We'll take time to read from verse one and get the scene before us. So let us. Hear the word of God from Ephesians 2 and verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. Amen. We'll end our reading there. May the Lord bless it to our hearts. Would you bow with me briefly in prayer? Our Father in heaven, we do come one last time thanking thee for the reading of the word of God. We are blessed to be a people under the sound of the reading of the Holy Scriptures today. And we pray that you will take this message and take it far beyond the ability of this preacher Lord, we know that thou art able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. And Lord, we pray now that you would fill me with thy spirit. Fill each person here with thy spirit. And give us help, Lord, to rightly hear and rightly be doers of what we hear. Set a watch before my mouth and keep the door of my lips that I would utter nothing that is not of God. Please hear prayer, Lord, and undertake for us now. In Jesus' name, amen. We are coming, as I said, to the latter part of verse 4 and verse 5, which read, For his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. Beholding God's grace in the gospel. That is what we are considering today. It is a major emphasis of the apostle and he has made a special note regarding the grace of God in the gospel in verse 5. By grace ye are saved. That is, in one sense, his summary of all that he has said here regarding uh, this deliverance that these people had experienced. Now, grace is a common word in the Christian's vocabulary. You probably use the term grace often. We just sang uh, two hymns, and they use that word so much and yet what does it mean to be saved by grace what does that term grace communicate to us how would you define it if i were to ask you how you define grace what would you say you could say many things there are many definitions of grace that have been given but i think we can say at least one definition of grace is the free and effectual saving favor of God. The free, effectual saving favor of God. That is what grace is communicating. It's free in the sense that it's unmerited. It's not for anything in you. It is unmerited saving favor. It's free. It is effectual which means it accomplishes that which it sets out to do. When God displays His grace, when He saves a sinner by grace, there is no failure in that purpose. It is effectual, saving favor of God. 
But perhaps grace is better illustrated than defined. Perhaps it is better illustrated than defined. You know, you find something very interesting in the Acts. You find a man named Barnabas going to see a new work of God, right? The, the preaching of the gospel has come to a place called Antioch. And there are those there who have received the message. They've believed and they've been saved. They've been brought to Christ. And so uh, this comes to the hearing of the apostles and they send forth Barnabas. And you know what it says there of Barnabas? It says when he went there, he saw the grace of God. He could see it, having seen the grace of God. What is that telling us? It's telling us that Barnabas could see the free and effectual saving favor of God being exercised upon a people. They could see it in how they had turned from their sins, how they were believing the gospel. And on and on it goes there. So perhaps it's better illustrated than defined. Perhaps it's something to behold more than to define. That is, in one sense, what the apostle has been doing as well. We read from verse 1 because I want us to get, again, that picture in mind. The apostle has given us an illustration of the gross nature of man's sin in order that he may display the better to us the greatness of God's grace. That is what he's been doing this whole time. He is laboring under inspiration to show us our sin outside of Christ in order to display to us grace. And so perhaps it is better seen, illustrated, than defined. Now, why why so much emphasis on this? Why are we taking time to deal so much with this? Last time we were beholding God's mercy in the gospel. This time we're beholding God's grace in the gospel. Why? Well, interesting thing occurred. Last night I was just reading Acts 15. And if you know the, the context there, I'll give you a summary if you don't. Basically, the chapter begins, Certain men went unto the brethren and taught them, that except ye be circumcised, ye cannot be saved. These men are teaching heresy. They're teaching men that there's a work to be done in order for you to be saved. You have to do something. Where did those men come from? Well, if you go on and you read the letter that was written to the churches after they meet and decide about this being heresy, they say, men which came out from us to you. Now you think about that with me. That's the apostolic church, right? I mean, these are the apostles. These are James, Peter, John, the men who knew, the men who preached salvation by grace alone. And yet it says that they came out from us. Men who had gone, had been under the sound of the preaching of the gospel, and yet they still had this inclination to add to the gospel. Now, we're free Presbyterians. We we are pretty confident that in most of our churches, the gospel is preached. That, That there's a gospel of free grace through Christ alone, by faith alone and Christ alone to the glory of God alone. We're fairly confident of that. And yet still, there is the possibility that we would forget that some would forget, that they could be under the sound of the gospel and go out and say, except ye be circumcised. What's that today? You hear people all the time, except ye be baptized, ye cannot be saved. Is that not what the Roman Catholic Church says? Is that not what other various heretical groups say? So I trust you see this is something that we need to be reminded of over and over and over again. And so today, brothers and sisters, we are simply beholding God's grace in the gospel. And so it is better illustrated, and we're going to keep that as our theme as we go through these verses. I want us to understand how God's grace is seen 
in the gospel? How is it to be beheld? And the first thing we want to see then is that God's grace is seen in his motivation to save. God's grace is seen in his motivation to save. What does our text say? But God, who is rich in mercy, for or because of his great love wherewith he loved us. That's his motivation to save. For his great love wherewith he loved us. That is sinners. Yes, elect sinners, but sinners. God's motivation to save sinners is his mere love for sinners. I don't mean mere in terms of small degree. I don't mean mere in terms of insignificant. I mean mere in terms of alone. It is only His love that motivates Him for His own glory to save sinners. That is something to behold. That is grace. Why is that grace? Well, you remember back in the first part of the epistle in chapter 1 and verse 4, according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. What is the apostle doing? He's taking your mind back, isn't he? To, to remember, to always remember that God, though He saw man in all of his sin, though He saw him in all of his rebellion, all of his ungodliness, all of his wretchedness, all of his wickedness, all of his service to Satan, He loved those Sinners. That is grace. That is unmerited favor. In other words, what we are saying here is that there is nothing in or about a sinner that calls forth God's redeeming love. There's nothing. Oh yes, there is a general love to to all of creation. A man is made in the image of God and as his creator, God has a general love. That's why he does what he does in the world, sustaining the world and all that he does there. But his redeeming love, his particular love, there is nothing in you or me to call forth that love. It is a free love. It is a mere love. And therefore, God's grace is seen in his motivation to save. Now, I said this to you last time. We're not speaking to spend a lot of time here. We we covered some of this last time, but I said this to you. You and I would think it strange to love a rotten corpse. Yet a holy God loves rotten sinners like you and me. It says that these people, that believers were dead in trespasses and sins. Even when we were dead in sins. Well, what does dead mean? It means dead. It means hopeless and helpless. It means without anything to to warrant the affection, the saving affection of God. You and I would, would be repulsed, wouldn't we? If someone brought a corpse before us and told us to love that corpse, you would be repulsed. You would turn away. And yet God loves rotten sinners. Don't ask me to explain why God would love anyone of his sinful creatures. But that's the reality. And that's how you see the grace of God in his motivation to save. Now, maybe there's an objection that comes here. Even from a believer. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. That comes off the the tail end of, of all this sin and all this wickedness. And perhaps the question would be, well, why, if God loves me, why did God allow me to fall so deep into sin? Have you ever asked that question? Why? If He loves me, why does He allow me to fall so deep into sin? I ask that question for myself. And yet the answer to that question for any believer and for any sinner who will repent and believe, the answer to that question is that it is to display to you the great depth of His love. Why does He allow you to fall so deep into sin? Well, you're going your own way. He didn't force you to do it. But He allows it to show you the great depth of His love. 
Even as the Apostle Paul would say that he was, as it were, an example to all them who will believe. And that is what it is. So let none of us be in doubt today. Though our sins be great. Though our wickedness be vile. God's love is not hindered by that sin. It is to show you the great depth of his love. Has it ever struck you that every sinner deserves nothing but wrath, yet every sinner is offered the fullness of God's mercy? Christ, when he gives his commission to the apostles, he, he doesn't say to them, now go and preach the gospel to the elect. What does he say? Go and preach the gospel to every creature. All of them. It is, as it were, that great supper, right? That great feast. Go and compel them to come in. Go and preach to them in the highways and the byways. We all deserve nothing but the eternal wrath of God. And yet, He offers. He offers a full and free pardon to every sinner that will repent and believe. That is grace. That is grace. That, that He requires no baptism of you, no circumcision of you, no good works of you, but offers you full and free pardon by His free grace. That is why Christ says to go and preach the gospel to every creature. And you know, some, some come to that and they, they say, well, the whole gospel? I mean, do we, do we offer Him in, in His fullness to them? Do we, do we say... That they can believe and, and, and be saved so freely? Preach the gospel to every creature. Leave the saving of mine elect to me, perhaps Christ would say. God's grace is seen in his motivation to save. But secondly, God's grace is seen in the sinners that he saves. Note what verse 5 says. Even when we were dead in sins. Even when. Even when we were dead in sins. God's grace is seen in the sinners that he saves. I've already said to be dead is to be helpless and hopeless. It is as Paul has defined it. To be walking in a disobedient course of the world. Disobeying the law of God. Walking under the influence in the service of the prince of the power of the air. Whether you know it or not. Possessed with that spirit of disobedience that works in the children of disobedience among everyone in the world has their conversation outside of Christ and to be by nature a child of wrath. That is, heading for wrath. These are the sinners that God saves. And therefore His grace is seen. It is beheld in that. Paul knew it. The Ephesians knew it. Do all of us here know it today? Do, do we behold His grace? Not only in our own salvation, but in the salvation of others. Do we recognize today that the blackness of your sin cannot eclipse the brightness of God's grace? I was thinking upon this this week in light of a conversation I was having with someone it says we are dead in sins. It's like a picture of a graveyard, a spiritual graveyard, if you will. Everyone's dead. But a graveyard is full of dead people at different levels of corruption. Right? You may find at different levels of corruption in a graveyard. I think we can apply that here. Though all be condemned and, and dead in their sins, yet there is, as it were, an evident corruption that is more easily seen in some rather than others. You think upon the difference between uh, Paul and the Ephesians. Paul was, was in, as it were, upright in his religion. An upstanding citizen. The Ephesians are pagans. They do all manner of wickedness. And yet they're all dead. But their corruption is seen differently. It, it manifests differently. Now... The reason I'm taking the time to say that is because I was thinking upon the day in which we live. 
and how we need to keep this always in our view as the people of God. We live in a day where many wear their deadness in a very outward manner, don't they? You can look. You can't always tell. I mean, it's not as if you, you dress a certain way, that means you're born again, but you, you, you can look and you can tell when someone is dead in sin. And the reason that's important is because so we hand out these cards. There may come in some people that have a very outward appearance of being dead in sin. And you think of all the different things there regarding their appearance, regarding how they look, how they smell, even how they behave. And as the people of God, we need to be constantly remembering in a day like today that God does not merely save the best of sinners, but the worst. So someone comes in, and we can't tell whether they're a man or a woman. How are we going to respond to that? We can't condone their sin, but we must preach the gospel to every creature. Beholding God's grace in the sinners that he saves. Because the Lord is able to save those people. And such were some of you, is what Paul said to the Corinthians. So God does not merely save the best of sinners, but the worst. But perhaps there would be some objections. And you can benefit from these, whether you're a believer, an unbeliever, or a believer struggling with assurance. Perhaps there would be some objections to this, this by grace ye are saved. This even when we were dead in sins. Consider a couple of those with me today. The first objection might be, well God's grace is not for me. How, how do I know that this grace is for me? How, how can I be assured that this offer is really for me? This richness and mercy, this great love, how can that ever be applied to me? How can I know that? Well, if you are under the sound of the preaching of the gospel, you can be assured that this grace is for you. What did Paul say in Acts chapter 13? He is preaching to a mixed multitude, Jews and Gentiles. And what does he say? Well, what's his assurance that, that he can offer the gospel to these people, Acts 13, 26, Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. He is able to look out at the people he's preaching to and say, to you is the word of this salvation sent. There's assurance there that if God has me preaching the gospel to this person, then it is assured that the grace of God can be applied to this person. But you say, perhaps someone says, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy of this grace. I, it can't be for me because I'm just not worthy of it. No one is worthy of grace. Grace is unmerited. And the more unworthy you feel, the more warrant you have to receive grace. You have all the warrant in the world to believe. God commandeth all men everywhere to repent and believe. The gospel. But if you feel unworthy, that is not a hindrance to receiving grace. That is a motivation to seek grace. But perhaps you say, I have weak faith. I don't have the faith to believe the gospel like they did in verse 13 of chapter 1 in whom also ye trusted after that ye heard the word of truth I don't have that faith I have weak faith that can't take hold of Christ well, weak faith is no disqualifier for great grace it, is, it makes grace shine all the brighter to, to, as it were, have your, your withered hand of faith that can't hold on to anything. 
you have a withered hand like that man the Lord healed, you can't hold on to anything. It's, it's useless. It's, worth for, it's good for nothing. You can't do anything with it. And yet, he stretches forth the withered hand and Christ heals him. Weak faith is no disqualifier for great grace. You say, but I'm too sinful. I'm too sinful to receive this grace. I, I've, I've been disobeying the law of God. I've been living in, in a life of sin. I've been living as a servant of Satan. Serving him night and day, employed in his business. There is good news for all. God delights to save those employed about the devil's business. He delights in that. He delights to bind the strong man and to spoil his goods. To, to take those that are Christ from the clutches of the devil. And then employ them as his children in his service. That is what he did with these. They were walking according to the prince of the power of the air, serving Satan, and yet God delighted to save them. And if we're ever in doubt of this, it is a witness to God's grace that those who shed Christ's blood should be saved by Christ's blood. Do you ever think upon that? That the, that the men who cried out, the men and the women who cried out for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, what greater sin can you imagine? Calling out for the shedding of His blood. Calling out for Him to die. And yet, what do we read in Acts 2 and verse 37? Verse 36, Peter says to them, God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ because of the remission of sins, for the remission of sins. It is because of of the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you. Can you believe that? That the sinners who shed Christ's blood should be saved by Christ's blood. Now that means that whoever you find out in the weak, whatever sinner crosses your path, they are not outside of the saving grace of God. That means no one here is outside of the saving grace of God. God's grace is seen in the sinners that he saves. God's grace is also seen, finally, in the extent to which he saves. God's grace is seen in the extent to which he saves. In verse 5, Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. With Christ. Quickened us together with Christ. That is the extent to which he saves. Now, what is significant here is that the Holy Spirit has summarized salvation in a word. Quickened. Brought to life. That's the idea behind this. By a spiritual union with Jesus Christ. That comes by faith, by the work of the Spirit. He, he brings uh, the believer into this union. He, he takes a person into a union with Christ, makes them alive. Brings them to spiritual life, gives them eternal life. These terms all should be seen in the same light. And he has summarized salvation in a word. That, that means, how, how do you know that, first of all? How do you know that that is summarizing salvation in a word? Well, he goes on. He hath quickened us together with Christ and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, that is in eternity. That is, he is saying that when God quickened these sinners, it was the whole of salvation, as it were, deposited. It was the down payment. So, so regeneration or the new birth that is what is included. Justification. A full and free justification. Pardon for sin and acceptance before God. Because of Christ's merits alone. 
Adoption into the family of God. Made sons legally by your relationship to Christ. The work of sanctification begun and assured to be perfected by an eternal glorification. That is included in this word. Quickened. So when you read quickened. What, what are you to take away from that? There is no trial period in the salvation of any sinner. There, there's no waiting to, to see how you're going to do. Well, well, we'll begin this and we'll see how they get on. And if they're not doing too well, we're going to move it. We're going to bring it back. God doesn't do that. He brings you all the way. Quickened us together with Christ. Once brought into union with Christ, you can never be severed from Christ. Salvation can never be severed from Christ. It is because when you come to this word quickened and the whole subject of the new birth, regeneration, it is something in terms of an experiential thing, something you experience, but at the same time, we ought to recognize that it is not just an experience. You know, a lot of people have an experience that don't know Christ. A lot of people can point to some spiritual experience that they feel was a, an evident thing, and yet that is not assurance for salvation. Salvation can never be severed from Christ. You know you have been quickened if you are believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Receiving and resting upon Him alone. That's how these believers knew it. What, what is Paul referring back to? Again, he's always hearkening back to what he's already said. In verse 13, they were told, You, you believed after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. He points them to that. That's the evidence of quickening. And so it can never be severed from Christ. And so it is a holy quickening. You know, God's grace is holy grace. It's a grace that required justice to be served for the sins of Christ's people. And it was upon the cross. And so now God can fully unleash the riches of Christ upon sinners God's work of regenerating grace necessitates his work of perfecting grace when he does his work of the new birth it is the assurance of glory as well included Amen. and so you see that we're, we're sitting as it were believers in Christ are sitting together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus Amen. now that's the reality that's the fact and that's why I say we, we don't want to place too much of an experience upon the facts. Because though that be the case, the Christian must not expect spring during winter. Do you know what I mean by that? You're a believer here. You know that you do not live every single day feeling like you're in the clouds. You don't live every day feeling like you're, like you're enthroned in heaven. And yet that's what this text says of you. If you're a believer in Christ, you're sitting together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's your fixed position. But it's not spring yet, in one sense. It's winter. We're traveling through this weary land. Doesn't mean that we're always miserable, as some would be. But it also doesn't mean... That we always have a perfect day either. It doesn't mean we always conquer our temptations, does it? We fail. We don't become perfect Christians here. We cry out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? We struggle. The, the flesh and the spirit and yet we know we can rest assured as we walk with God in this world, spring is coming. Spring is coming. And the flowers will blossom. And we will be in eternal bliss, free from sin forever. Oh, the day. Oh, for the day that that will be. 
The last thing here as we think about this third point. God's grace is seen in the extent to which he saves. Again, I don't want to skip over this. The question obviously comes, how do I know if I have been quickened? Have I been quickened? How do you know that today? <laughs> Oldest to youngest, children to adults, how do you know if you've been quickened? How do you know? You know you can know. All of us here can know that. At the heart of evidence for the new birth and God's quickening grace is faith in Jesus Christ. We defined faith a few weeks ago, right? The catechism definition is very helpful. It is receiving and resting upon Christ alone. That's what faith is. It's not mountain faith. Sometimes we get that in our head, that there's just this, this great faith that, that is required. It is simply receiving and resting upon Christ alone. And that a natural man will not do. You will only receive and rest upon Christ alone by the work of the Spirit of God. And that is the assurance that you've been born again. It's not that you, you, you've turned from some great sin. Because what happens if you fall back into sin? David's assurance had to be given back to him. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. So the evidence at the heart of it all is faith in Christ. Yes, it's obedience in terms of the other things. But it is faith in Christ. That is what is needed. That is what is at the heart of the evidence. But maybe... Someone would say, well, I, I don't have that faith yet. I haven't trusted in Christ to the salvation of my soul. So, so what, what am I to do then? What, what am I to do then? Well, are you desiring to receive and rest upon Christ alone? Is that your desire? Do you desire Christ for the salvation of your soul and Him alone? His merits alone? His life, His death, His resurrection. Do you desire to receive and rest upon that alone? Well, that is an evidence that you ought to believe now. You think about this in terms of the calling of an elder. You, say, you come to salvation, you say, well, I must, I must be called of God. I must have effectual calling. And, and I don't know if I have that, so then I can't come. What is the first evidence of effectual calling? And I think you can see a parallel here, even with the calling of an elder. That must be a call of God, right? Upon a ruling elder. And what does it say in 1 Timothy 3? If any man desire the office. Well, may I, may I apply that then to coming to Christ? If you desire to receive and rest upon Christ alone, that isn't all the evidence in the world that you need to believe that you're being effectually called. Because the natural man understandeth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. May this sink deep down into all of our hearts. Believer, everyone here, let no one of us lose sight of grace. Is this text true of you? Is this text true of you? Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are ye saved. Is that true of you? Is that your testimony today? If it is not, and you are a stranger to grace, then be introduced today. There is no reason to delay that. So that you can then sing the song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I'd be glad to speak with anyone here who needs help in discerning those things.
But you can call upon God where you are and receive a full salvation. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do come before Thee in the name of Christ and thank Thee for Thy Word and pray for help to rightly receive it, to, to rightly take hold of it, to take it with us into the week. O oh Lord, we live in a day full of gross wickedness. Our society is decaying all around us. And yet, Lord, we know that Thou dost save great sinners by great grace. Lord, we think of Manasseh. We think of Paul. We think of David. We think of all these people. Lord, we think of ourselves. And pray that you will cement this word in our hearts. You will plant us today in beholding God's grace in the gospel. Hear, Lord. Give help to us. Save any lost soul that will hear this message, whether now or later. Have mercy upon them. In Jesus' name we pray.